Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're right on time. We have. Uh, let's just wait for one or two minutes as people coming in. Uh, we have probably several new uh, uh, people joining us today. And that's, uh, let's wait for probably one more minute. Okay, let's see. So being right here, that's, that's great. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay, okay, so I think we should get started uh, since we have a few new people joining us. Let's do a quick round of uh, self-introduction. Just uh, say your name uh, and your program. Uh, and let's see, uh, let's, let's go around the Hollywood Square and, and introduce everyone. And uh, I think you all know myself. Uh, I'm Zhu Peng An, a professor at the Brown School and Division of Computational Social uh, Data Sciences at WashU. So we established this AI interest group uh, because we want to learn from each other. Uh, so it's as simple as that. Uh, because now uh, the AI is so pervasive, uh, prevalent and uh, invasive that uh, it has been embedded in, in every single sector uh, in this world. And we have new development every single day, probably around the clock. So no one of us will be able to grasp all of them. Uh, you know, uh, we are probably just scratching the surface of what is available uh, on the market. And uh, there are many exciting open source software developed and distributed. So we want to have a full grasp uh, and follow the, the trend of this technology advancement. So therefore we need many eyes to look at you no know, different development and share uh, your expertise and what you learn from uh, the most the most recent development to uh, all of us, so we can stay on top of everything, um, and we can all definitely learn from each other. So that is the reason why we have this interest group, and we have been uh, active for uh, several months, uh, probably almost half a year. So let's keep the uh, good work and we'll continue our journey uh, and many of uh, our new cohort um, people from elsewhere are going to join us. So um, that's really, really exciting. Uh, and then let's go around the uh, the Hollywood Square and just briefly introduce your name and, and your program. Uh, so Yu Yi, uh, could you get started? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Yu Yi Yang. Um, I'm a first year PhD student in computational and data sciences. Um, nice to meet you all. Great, uh, and Bin Yuan. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Bing, uh, my name is Bin Yuan and I'm second year and PhD student in AP and Bio. Uh, uh, and I'm going to uh, give my talk today, thank you. Great, right, thank you. And Ted? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ted. I'm, I'm from Ethiopia. I'm a new PhD in public health sciences student. Nice to meet you all. And I hope yeah. to keep with something in the future. Great to see you, Ted, here. And uh, Pei Chi? Hello, everyone. My name is Pei Chi. Uh, I'm from the Information System program, but I really love to learn about AI, so that's why I joined the group. And it's nice to see you all. Fantastic. Yeah, PJ has been working with me uh, for a while in an exciting project. And Shambhavi? 
Hi everyone, my name is Shambhavi and I'm also in the second year MPH EpiBio concentration. I'm sorry I can't open my camera. It's yeah, I'm, yeah that's why. No, I'm, yeah. no, no worries. Great to have you here. <laughs> uh, and uh, Junxin. Uh, Junxin can you hear us. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, Jin. Uh, hi, Ron. My name is Jin. This is my second year here. Uh, my first year, I uh, joined this group as an MSP student, and this is my sec uh, first year here as a student in MSW program, and my concentration is mental health. Welcome to this amazing group. Wonderful. Uh, and Jin? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Shen Jin, a teacher from China University of Geosciences Science, Beijing. My research area focuses on environmental and health or physical activity. I'm very honored to participate in Dr. N's AI study group. I look forward to learning from today's sharing. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Jing. Yeah, we have been collaborating in many projects. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, Xiaoxin. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Wang Xiaoxin, a PhD in sports science from China. And uh, currently, I'm a visiting scholar of Dr. N. Great, great, great. Uh, and uh, Jia He. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jia He, and I'm doing Master of Data Science at the University of Melbourne. I joined Professor N's AI application for health data program uh, this year, and I'm really glad to attend today's study group. Hopefully we can uh, learn more together. Thanks. That's fantastic. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And Charles? Hi everyone, um, sorry. Hi everyone, my name is Charles. I'm a second year DCDS student in the public health social work track. Um, nice to meet everyone and learn from everyone. Um, yep. Fantastic. Uh, Shen Shen. Hello everyone, I'm Shen Shen. I'm a fourth year PhD student from a North Texas Health Science Center in um, epidemiology. Nice, nice to see you all. Great, great. Yeah. So uh, Shen Shen and I, we also have some collaborations. That's fantastic. Uh, and fun. Hi, everybody. My name is Fan Yang. I'm an assistant professor in China. And right now, I'm Dr. An's visiting scholar. I'm glad to meet, all, uh, meet you all and excited to learn. Great. And Jeremy. Oh, um, sorry, it's kind of dark here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy, and um, I'm a senior and a grad student majoring in math and CS, and I'm planning to um, study AI in grad school as well. So I'm really interested in it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, welcome to our group. Uh, you're probably used, uh, the, the youngest one. Uh, in yeah, probably. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, who I haven't introduced yet? Uh, so uh, let's, let's see. Any anyone? Uh, Junxin, can can you hear us? Oh, great. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm studying. I'm studying business I'm studying sports training. Thank you. Great, yeah, Junshi, nice to, to, to see you here. Yeah, nice to be here. Uh, and uh, Zi Yun, is, is that right, Zi Yun? Hi, yes. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Okay, hi everyone. I'm Zi Yu Meng. I'm from China, Wuhan. Uh, I'm a new student in public health. Uh, my concentration is biostats. Nice to meet you. 
Great, yeah, I, I just got to know Ziyun in the uh, the IPBio uh, concentration presentation. Great to see you here. Uh, and uh, Ying Hu. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ying Hu Zhang, and I'm the second year MP student doing IPBio. Great, great. Now we have a full house. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, many of you are new to the to the group, and I believe that uh, you have already sent your invitation uh, regarding you know, some general rules and principles uh, of participation. So basically, the, the rules are very easy. There are just two rules, right? One is to attend the, the session as much as you can. Um, if you absolutely cannot do it someday, you know, let uh, Yu and I know. Uh, but we anticipate your continuous and regular participation, right? Because that is the way that we learn. Uh, if you don't participate, then, well, um, the, the group would not be very helpful to you at all. Uh, and the second role is, you no know, uh, down the road, I probably may ask you to present as well, uh, because this is a self-learning group and we try to help each other. You no, know, doing presentation is a very important skill uh, that you want to learn uh, in the graduate school, right? So it's important to share, being able to self-learn uh, the materials and then share with others. Uh, it is uh, very beneficial, mutually beneficial, and also uh, a good practice uh, for your presentation and oral communication skills. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome Bing Yuan to give us his fantastic talk on artificial intelligence um, in NLP. Yeah, Bing Yuan, go ahead. The floor is all yours. Hey, uh, so can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, Today we're gonna talk about the deep speed chat, which is the one of the uh it's an AI training system and is most time we use it to train a language model. Uh it's especially the AI that is chat TV like. And uh it's utilized cutting edge technology to create advanced dialogue systems in and in this presentation, uh uh, we're going to start with uh, how to train a large language model from scratch, like from the literally the first line of your code. Oh. And uh, here's uh, uh, here's the uh, some few steps that you might uh, you might need from the uh, training a large language models. Uh, first step is choose the right framework in the right language uh, programming languages. The the framework, choosing the right framework in the programming language actually, actually is very crucial for uh, a large language model training, uh, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, and the programming languages such as Python and Julia, which is most frequently used. Also, uh, after you set all the, uh, choose the right framework and the language, you, and then you may process to uh, collecting and uh, processing your data. The data collection and uh, preparation is also very uh, is also very essential. Uh, and uh, gather a diverse and extensive data set of text uh, will help you to train your language model uh, and will help it to perform better in the future. And also, you have to clean your uh, data, uh, like to remove uh, some special characters converting to lower cases, of course, tokenization. So here I got a screenshot. Uh, so sorry, Bing Yuan, uh, just one, one second. Uh, I just want to confirm with Yu Yi that this session is recorded. Oh. I, yes. If not, it, it's recorded. Okay. okay. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, then we have, then this is actually a, a, a screenshot from Hugging Face. We know that Hugging Face provides us with a lot of useful data set. And this is a text data set uh, on Hugging Face. You can see that. Uh, it's a question answering uh, data set and we got a uh, input which is a lot of questions and the right answers this is a very clean data set which means uh you've got a right answer right question right input and right answer and then after collecting and processing your data you might uh, also pro uh, proceed to tokenization vocabulary mode uh, model architecture and implement uh, and the implementations so tokenization, uh, what tokenization means is that uh, uh, it's mean that 
tokenize the text into a smaller units, such as a word or a subword, and build build your own vocabulary from the uh, those tokens and assign each token with the unique numerical identifier. And also, you you need to choose a deep learning architecture from your language model. Uh, for example, transformer, uh, transformer based architectures. And uh, and uh, here I'm gonna talk a little bit more about tokenization, uh, which is uh, I think is very important. And joining the training, the tokenization is the process of breaking large set of text into a sequence of text into smaller units known as tokens. And tokens can be words, subwords, characters. Uh, lingui or are they ling linguist units? For example, sentence, some sentence that you might use frequently, so you don't have to break it, totally break it down. Uh, here is some tokenization strategies, like the word tokenization is breaking word text into individual words. Subword tokenization is breaking down words into smaller subword units. For example, we, we have the word unhappy. So we might break it down into the uh, prefix on and uh, the word happy. So next time when we try out uh, AI model, uh, we uh, the uh, the language model might know that uh, the word start with U and might mean something negative. Also, character tokenization that is split every word into characters. By pair, oh, oops, by pair encoding, which is known as BPE, uh, it's a subword tokenization unit that identify the most frequent pairs of characters and then replace them with special tokens. Also, we, we also have sentence. So token basically is the smaller units of text. It can be anything. After that, oh. so after that, uh, we finally could start our training and fine tuning. Uh, the to train mode, uh, you first start with your process data set. That is the clean data you provided. Training the language model like ChatGPT from scratch requires a, a significant amount of computational power often utilize multiple CPUs, even G GPUs or TPUs. And after the initial training, you might also need to fine tune the model uh, on a narrow data set or a specific task to make it more relevant from particular use. After the training and fine tuning, you finally get your demo, then you start your evaluation. Make sure it's performs as you wish. Then you can deploy it. Uh, but that's not the end of the story because after deploy uh, deploy your uh, language model, you you always find that there's something goes wrong. Some answer is not that satisfy uh, satisfying, so you have to repeat all the process again and again to make sure it's improved. Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, and uh, and what we done, what the deep speech chat of uh, uh works most is during the fine tuning process, and uh here we we're gonna talk about a little bit more about the steps in fine tuning. Uh, there are actually three steps within fine tuning. One is the uh the supervised fine tuning. It's basically the first step. Uh, after you train your AI model, the supervised fine tuning is the human response to various queries uh, are, and uh, are carefully selected to fine tune the pre-trained language models. Uh, that is, uh, during this process, human provide the very right answer to the AI model and make sure it, the AI model knows the basic, the basic rules or, the, or at least the, the, the way you wish. Then after that, uh, we have a reward fine tuning. It's uh, a, uh, actually, we, we might have a separate model, which usually is uh, smaller than SFT, uh, which is a supervised fine-tuning model. Uh, and we call it a reward model. It's trained with the data set that has human provided ranking of multiple answers to the same query. Uh, let's take an example. For example, uh, you have a question is, what is one plus one? Then you provide two answers. One is two, one is one zero. Both are the right answer, but uh, we might give to a higher reward because this is most frequently used and this is the answer we wish. We can't say one, one zero is wrong because it's binary, but uh, most time, uh, for most time we don't use binary. So uh, we might also think, give it a, a positive reward, but with lower rank. Um, we, must, we might also have a, another answer three, but this is definitely the wrong answer. So we might give it a negative reward. After we have the uh, reward model and the supervised model, then we put them together for the reinforcement learning from hu human feedback. 
uh, which is mo uh, one of the most time consuming steps during the fine, fine tuning process. So the SFT model uh, is further fine tuned with the reward feedback from the reward model using the uh, uh, proximal policy optimization algorithm. Uh, we we're going to talk about this later, uh, uh, but uh, what I want to mention is that in deep speech chat, the developer actually add two more features for the reinforcement learning from human feedback. One is exposure, uh, exposure, uh, exponential moving av uh, average. This will help the the uh, the deep speech chat to collect the base uh, checkpoint. Uh, this actually uh, EMA based the checkpoint can be chosen from the final evaluation, which is much efficient. Also, the mixer training uh, uh, makes the pre trained objective, for example, the, the words prediction and the, the PPO objective, which is the, uh, using this algorithm uh, to prevent regression performance on a public benchmark. So, here we're going to talk a little bit about what is uh, PPO. So, there are basically seven essential concept about PPO. Uh, so PPO is a reinforcement learning algorithm used to optimize the policy of agents in environment where the interact learn through the trial and the error. PPO is designed to address some of the limitations of earlier policy optimization method by providing more stable, efficient way to update policy. So uh, during fine tuning, what do we wanna do or what do we wanna have is to make our policy or the the strategy AI model would choose more clear, more uh more stable. So uh this so PPO algorithm is basically uh help with this result. The first uh, first concept of policy optimization problem. Uh so in the enforcement uh, enforcement learning the goal is to find a policy that maximize the expected cumulative reward in an environment. People focus on optimizing the policy to achieve this goal. Basically, uh, what policy opt optimization problem is, it's like a little bit like the greedy algorithm. Uh, it's, li it's like using this part, using this algorithm is more like choosing the, uh, uh, the answer that gains most reward and use this to update the uh, policy that it will be used in the uh, in the further training. Uh, and objective function, PBO aims to maximize the expected cumulative reward while ensuring that policy update doesn't deviate too much from the government policy. This is done to maintain stability during the learning process. So object, uh, objective function, what objective function do is to just make sure the whole system is stable. Uh, make sure the policy would, wouldn't gone too far. And the clip segregated objective, uh, PPO introduced a clip segregated objective function that limits the change in the policy update. Basically these are, these are talking about the, the two, uh, the same thing. Uh, th this is a function that limits the changes in the policy update. This helped to prevent large policy updates that could lead to unstable learning. The objective function encourages a new policy to close to the old policy while ensuring better performance. Then what the most important part is policy updates because that's what we do for the fine tuning. We always want a new policy added to the old one so that the AI model would perform better. Also the advantage estimation, what people can do is typically use an estimate advantage of function, which responds how much or better or worse uh, actions compared to the average action in given state. Advantage estimation helps in assessing the impact of action to cumulative reward. Uh, the, these two, this advantage ad estimation actually helps with uh, policy optimization because uh, it's like estimate how much reward would the action uh, would the action uh, uh, take so so that. So that it, uh, the algorithm would help shoot the action that gets most uh, uh, gets most reward. Also, the value function, some variants of PPO incorporate a value function to estimate the expected cumulative reward. Uh, and the multiple abcos that uh, uh, th this actually uh, is PPO can do uh, helps PPO uh, to, to uh, repeat its work for multiple times without. Uh, doing the same thing over and over again.
So that could be a little bit confusing, I know, but I think it's quite important uh, during the reinforced learning from human feedback. Because it's a, this is a most basic algorithm used in this pro, uh, in this step. So uh, I hope this uh, this picture will help you to understand uh, what's going on just now. Because uh, this is the step within fine tuning. The fine tuning. The first step, as we just talked about, is SFT supervised fine tuning. Is that we use human label data and the AI model, the pre-trained AI model. Uh, we want to find to uh, to get the uh, to get the supervised fine tuning model, and then on the other hand, at the same time, we use pair the good bad answer, good and the bad answers, uh, for the pre-trained model to get the reward model. Then we combine them together. Uh, the the SFT at the actor model and the reward model could give the uh, could be the creator model reward model to give uh to like to judge what's the how the actor model uh, respond and uh also at the same time they will generate uh the experience and we will save the experience for further fine tuning and here is the ppo we just mentioned is using ppo algorithm to make sure the policy updates and uh, updates as bad as uh, as good as it can so let's go a little bit further deep into what is the reinforcement learning from human feedback? The, the definition of uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback is an approach in machine learning where agent learns to perform the task through a combination of a trial and error and a guidance from human feedback. That means, uh, firstly, the AI model, the actor model would interact with the environment. At the same time, human would join the training process and give the feedback uh, make sure it it won't make sure even though there's a minor uh, minor arrow it would become a big arrow. So the base uh, the workflow of RLHF is reinforced learning from human feedback. Firstly, we we should have some initial policy. That's that's why we have the supervisor fine tuning. Uh, we 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 get the initial policy and and the learning process start with the initial policy, which is agent strategy for taking actions in the environment. Uh, this policy could be random or based on some priority knowledge. Most time it's based on some priority knowledge. And the, the interaction with the environment, this taking action based on current rules and give feedback and get feedback from the environment. So basically the feedback uh, is given by the reward mode and the, the, there's an inference engine we're gonna talk about later. So the agent interacts with the environment by taking actions based on current policy. It receives feedback in the form of rewards from the environment from each action it takes. The reward indicates the immediate quality of the action and help agent to understand what action are desirable. So that uh, that's why we that's why we we just talk about PPO because. Uh, the, the process of deciding what action is desirable and update the policy or, or what this is a rule uh, is done by PPO algorithm. And uh, here uh, we also, uh, after that, after interact with the, in, the, with the environment, uh, we have the human feedback where, where human provide feedback that helps agent to understand the quality for actions beyond an immediate reward. So in our LHF, uh, human feedback introduced to guide the learning process. Human provide feedback that helps the agent understand the quality of its action beyond the immediate rewards, uh, which means human uh, human feedback at the start, human feedback have higher weight than the uh, outcome that uh, given by the re reward model. This feedback can be in various forms, such as uh, sim a simple comparison of actions, like action A is better than action B, uh, and this is an order directly given from human. And the ranking actions, rank those actions from best to worst or binary feedback, maybe just good or bad. After that, uh, the reward mode, after that, the reward mode from human feedback, the, the reward mode also need to update from human feedback. The human feedback is used to construct new reward mode, uh, that assign values to a different actions based on the feedback. This reward model guides agents exploration and learning, encouraging to action 
uh, that more aligned with the human preference. So what we just do now, uh, human feedback is not directly interact with the actor mode we want to train. It's actually help to update the reward mode to make sure it gave higher weight to the answer that we want. After that, the policy should be improved. The agent use a combination of the environment rewards and reward from model derived from human feedback to update the policy. So that next time when the AI model making decision, it will use the updated policy rather than the old one. This is also PPO too. Uh, so after that, we should repeat the process again and again. And the human in the loop, the 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 feedback from human in the loop uh, should lower its weight uh, with each time we uh, which the process goes. Because uh, human feedback continues to play a role in throughout the learning process, but gradually decreasing in the importance and the agent's policy become more proficient. This helps in fine tuning the agent behavior and addressing any uh, uh, difference between agent's action and uh, uh, human preference. But this is not like one way trip. We should do it over and over again to make sure that the AI model is fine uh, is fine tuned. So uh, after we know some all the basic rules, all these basic understanding of uh, of the AI uh, training an AI model, we finally could get started with what is deep speech chat. So, uh, so, so chat. sorry, Bing Yuan. Uh, so before uh -huh. you 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 go into that, uh, so I just want to uh, you know make a few comments uh, for those of us who are new to NLP at all, uh, because you no know, uh, Yuan is talking a lot about advanced, uh, for example, reinforcement learning incorporation into the large language model training. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar either NLP or RL, uh, here are a, a few uh, no basic information uh, just for you to, to get started. So if you know about natural language processing is the way that we use artificial intelligence uh, to uh, interact with human using natural language. And uh, if you have ever played with ChatGPT, you already know how powerful it is. And then, uh, so previously, before the ChatGPT uh, that introduced the uh, RL or the reward model into the NLP. So previously, most of the NLP models are called causal models. So basically, uh, the models are trained using uh, human provided text alone uh, without human feedback. So the model learned, for example, in the in a causal modeling approach, the model first learned the first um, the, uh, the the first word in a sentence, and then try to predict the next word, and then it take two words uh, to predict the next word. So it always go you know, one one word ahead to make the prediction. Uh, but the problem is that you no, know, the prediction is basically just a task completion, right? So sometimes it's not aligned with our human preference. So that is the reason why Bin Yuan um, mentioned and emphasized how we could provide human feedback as a way to supplement this uh, self uh, training, so that the uh, AI models not only learn from text alone. Uh, but also from our human preferences. And the way that we incorporate human preferences is through providing the reward function as well. As the reward function is set as a prior, right? Uh, so it's, it's trained at the same time as the NLP model. But on top of that, BUM mentioned about the human in the loop. So basically, uh, the human also read the machine generated text and then provide uh, the uh, the feedback on the on the fly, and then while well, the machine is going to take into account not only the preset reward but also uh, what we provide as human being on the fly to adjust the learning process. So that is the reason why I mentioned about the iterative process plus the human in the loop, uh, which really make the chat GPT so powerful in comparison to previous natural language processing models. Okay, so that is just a, a brief recap. So hopefully it can help people uh, digest this advanced uh, information. So B yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's start with uh, what is deep, deep speech chat. 
uh, deep speech chat is not like chat GPT. It's not a, 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 an, an AI. It's deep speed. It's a deep learning optimization uh, library that makes distributing uh, distributed training and the inference easy, efficient, and very effective. So basically, it's an AI training system. And this this is actually the the definition from the, uh from Deep Speech at uh the the GitHub site uh I just copied it to, uh, to here, and uh and uh is also uh and firstly it's a AI training system and on uh on the other hand it has a very specific feature that is very uh very, it has high speed low cost. So basically, it uses less time and uh, requires fewer GPUs while training uh, very large language models with uh, billions of uh, prompts. Uh, and uh, also, it's intelligent in inference. Uh, DeepSpeed brings together innovation in parallelism technologies and uh, com combines them with the high performance costume inference kernels, which is basically why uh, it has really high speed. Um, uh, so, uh, so one, 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 uh, one comment here just on, on this slide. Uh, so for those of you, uh, again, who have not trained any uh, computer vision or natural language processing models before, uh, so the key difference there, you no, know, because well, uh, presumably you've run some regressions using Stata or R or maybe SPSS. And usually you get the answers instantaneously, right? Uh, the, the reason is those models are very small and the, the data set you use are also small, right? So that it doesn't really uh, take long for the computer to process uh, that computation for you. But here we, we are in a completely different scenario. We, uh, so so Bin Yuan talking about the models with billions of parameters, right? If you consider regression model with a hundred uh, independent variable is a large model, then consider how about a regression model with one billion parameters, right? So that is the, the size of the model we are talking about. It is impossible for you for us to use uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the CPUs, uh, no matter how powerful the CPUs are, uh, because CPU consider the sequential computing is just not good for uh, paralyzing the, the, the computation. So therefore, I mentioned about the GPU, uh, the graphical computation unit, which is well designed to do this, uh, to this computation, uh, multi-thread computation at the same time, simultaneously. However, even if we use GPU, uh, the, the training cost and, and the time we spend on training are still very substantial. So for example, training the ChatGPT model once cost a billion dollars. And usually we need uh, multiple GPUs, for example, hundreds of thousands of GPUs and computation lasts for several months to a year, right? So that is a computation uh, we, we talk about in training those large language models. And therefore, it is almost impossible for, for each of us, uh, unless, well, you know, you, 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 you are Elon Musk, right? That you, you can afford to train those models. For individuals, it's almost impossible. It's out of reach, right? Cost-wise, time-wise. So therefore, uh, that is the, the invention of deep speed, which really uh, bring down the cost at, uh, the, of training large language models uh, and the, the speed. So that, that is the innovation that we want to, to learn all from here. So Bing Yuan, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. So before we start to start to widely so advanced, I want to mention that the major challenge and the cost during uh, the training of AI language models. Firstly, funding, of course, as we just mentioned, it costs billions of dollars. Here's, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, 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 here's a, a screenshot from Hugging Face that if you want to use Nevada A100 large uh, GPU, it costs you like four dollars per hour for each GPU. And uh, for the large language model, a single GPU would not be enough. So you can see it's, it's actually cost a lot. Of, and also, as we just mentioned, the time consuming. And for the, for the, for the machine itself, uh, the, there are actually two challenges. First one is memory use and data parallelism. 
uh, here, uh, before we, uh, I, I'll explain what is data parallelism later, but uh, here we, we have to know that uh, while you are training your AI models, you, you have to make sure that uh, the AI model uh, during training had to remember the, uh, the, the uh, parameters you have or the experience it generated. It takes a lot of memory. And also the scalability changes uh since in most time in most time uh we uh for the big companies they they train their AI models with not one single gpu or not one single device there would be a lot of devices training their uh, training their AI model and at the same time which we call this the model parallelism so the application of model parallelism which uh practitioners the model across multiple devices confronts limits of inefficient scaling beyond, beyond a solitary computing node. This is attributed to the uh, indirect nature of fine-grained uh, computations associated cost-intensive communication demands. Moreover, the uh, integration of model parallelism frameworks necessity extensive coding efforts, which may be contingent upon the specific model's architecture. So basically, uh, there are always a limitation of how much devices you can use at the same time, uh, uh, which is what we, we call the scalability changes here. And for the memory, the employment of data parallelism, which uh, I'll explain what is data parallelism later, uh, while enhancing the computational throughout does not yield a co uh, commercial reduction in memory footprint per individual device. This is conspiracy evident, uh, evident when uh, considering model exceeding the 1 billion parameter uh, threshold, as even GPUs endowed with 32 GB of memory are able to accommodate them adequately. So, if we, uh, so, uh, here I'm going to explain what, uh, so, uh, about the data parallelism. Uh, data parallelism basically is, uh, think about we have a very large data set. And if we start with the one uh one point of the data set, it would take a lot of time to process a whole data set. But if we start with the multiple uh, point of the data set, like we cut the data set into smaller pieces, smaller chunks, and uh, we offer the smaller chunks to different uh, GPUs and make them process at the same time, it could be much faster. So this is basically what the data parallelism is doing. So why it is so advanced? Uh, so the reason why deep speed chat uh, is so advanced is that uh, it applies first is applied a hybrid engine. We know that uh, we uh, when we are talking about uh, reinforcement learning from, from human feedback, we know that uh, there's two things happen during the reinforcement learning. One is the action mode. Uh, we'll take uh, uh, we'll take the inputs from the environment and uh, judge it by the environment by the reward mode. And uh, on the other hand, the uh, the inference engine, which is will provide the evaluation of the outcome and generate the experience. So uh, normally, this will takes a lot of time to switch between the uh, the training engine, the, the process we train the actor model. Uh, and the process we use to evaluate and generate the experience. Uh, but deep speed chat applies a hybrid engine, which can efficiently manage the training engine and the inference engine. Like these two processes could happen not at the same time, but uh, deep speed chat makes manage to uh, manage to make it uh, more efficiently. And the seamless transition between deep speed training and the inference is achieved with the evaluation and the training models uh, enable for the actor model. Also, well, as we just talked, memory consumption is also a problem. But uh, Deep Search Chat uh, applies uh, uh, memory management, optimized kernels, and uh, tensor parallelism boost inference throughout the during the experience generation phase, which uh, makes it uh, makes it uh, makes it possible that memory the uh, managing the memory more efficiently. Also, the memory optimization techniques like zero, uh, which we're going to talk about later, what is zero, uh, zero technology and a low rank adaptation are used during the training execution. The configuration between different models 
memory system is reconfigured and uh, maximize availability during the different models, avoiding bottlenecks and supporting large bench size. So this graph is uh, actually what we just talked about. During the, during the uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback, the actor mode was trained by the training engine. The engine will uh, use zero technology uploading uh, anything you can think about to, uh, to make the actor model to, to train it. And the outcome would be evaluated by the inference engine and the generated experience. So what hybrid engine do is to switch uh, parallelism is firstly the uh, manage the data management memory and uh, switch the uh, between these two engine efficiently, uh, so that make sure that you make full use of GPUs. So here's the uh, intro to zero plus plus engine. So zero engine is actually the older version. Uh, is applied in the older version of the DeepSpeed Chat, but the latest version of DeepSpeed Chat use zero plus plus. Uh, here uh, in, in zero engine, there's two parts. One is uh, the they using zero DP using data parallelism, which is very uh, a very classic strategy and uh, eliminates memory efficiency in data parallelism. Also, uh, here we're going to talk more about what is data parallelism. So data parallelism uh, is basically uh, data parallelism. It's a parallel computing technique which more multiple processors or computational units work on different parts of the data set simultaneously. The primary goal of data parallelism is to process a large data set or perform repetitive uh, operations on data more efficiently by splitting the data into smaller chunks and process those data chunks in parallel. Here are some main concepts we're gonna talk about. One is data uh, parallel processing, the data parallelism enables parallel processing by distributing data across multiple uh, process units, such as GPU core, uh, CPU cores or GPUs, and performing the same computation on each subset of data uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, so basically, uh, if we don't use data parallelism, what will probably happen is you get eight cores in your CPU, and the first core is full loaded, for, uh, Work, work as like full, like 100% of its power, but the rest of seven might just wait and uh, did nothing. So data parallelism uh, basically uh, using, make full use of all the cores, all the GPUs you have. And the data distribution, which is very important to driving data parallelism. The data set is divided into smaller uh, uh, parts or batches, but, and each process unit receives one or more of these uh, parts for computation. Each unit works on the subset of data independently. Um, but in order to get the, in order to uh, make sure uh, we have the result as soon as possible, there should be another technique called simultaneous execution. This requires all the process units, uh, like your CPU, your GPUs, uh, receive uh, like approximately the same amount of data so that they can finish their work uh, at the same time, this is called the simultaneous execution. Uh, so, so this helps you to get the result, uh, like the right result as soon as possible. This operation could be mathematical. Uh, and uh, after that, you can do what you have to, uh, like your next step after each uh, processing unit finished their work, this operation could be mathematical, uh, machine learning model update or any task you can imagine. After process is uh, respective get data, we have the aggregation. Uh, the result often aggregate or combine to the final output. The aggregation step might involve summing values, average result, or combining them in other ways depending on the specific task you have. Data parallelism is particularly useful when dealing with large data sets. So if you have smaller, smaller data set, uh, you probably don't need this because one, C uh, one processing unit might be enough. But if you have really large data set, like, like we just, we, we're gonna see uh, it's like maybe 13 billion, uh, 30 billion parameters, or maybe even larger, you have to use data parallelism to, uh, to help your, make full use of your, all your devices. Uh, and also the load balancing, as I just mentioned, that uh, each processor should be receive uh, approximately the same amount of data to so make sure that they can handle work 
at almost at the same time. So after that, we uh, we can finally uh, uh, we can finally go to the zero R. R is stand for residues, which is one of the I think this is one of the most genius design in zero engine because zero R, uh, because uh, each time you train your uh, AI model, there there will be assigned some memory, but uh, but zero R to optimize the residual memory consumed by by uh by your activation by your activations um uh, uh each time you train AI model uh people notice that the checkpoint helps but not sufficient for large models so zero R zero R optimize the activation memory by identifying removing the activation uh activation uh residues in the existing um model parallelism approaches through the activation uh, partitioning. It also offloads the activation to G CPUs when appropriate. And the zero R defines the appropriate size for temporary buffers to strike for balance of memory and computational efficiency. Uh, basically, uh, this, this helps zero engine to make it possible to use the residual memory, make sure it's not wasted, and um, make sure the residual memory uh, even make sure that uh the this uh the CPU could offer the right amount of memory for each step. So after uh after people evolve zero engine to zero plus plus, uh the amazing part is reduce. Firstly, we know that the uh there's more for those big uh, large models. There are always more than one devices uh is taking the task. So there should be a way that all those devices they can communicate with each, with each other. If you're going only got two devices, that the communication, uh, the volume of communication is okay. But if you imagine you get one hundred devices or one thousand devices, it could be a nightmare to manage their communication. So what amazing about zero plus plus is reduce the communication value. So make uh make it easier for people to uh, manage all the devices, all the models, uh parallelism strategies uh, runs on different devices. And it's also block of quantized weights, hierarchical weights, and uh, all these communications make sure uh, that make sure the communication between devices is more efficient and also make sure uh, the memory assigned, uh, assigned to each step is uh, more uh, efficient, more uh, and also it overlaps compute and the communicational uses optimize the CUDA kernel for quantization, quantization, quantization and the dequantization and the tensor slice uh, uh, reordering. So this is something very tech. Uh, so I think think uh, if you don't know it, okay. So the uh, there's a comparison, quick comparison between zero and zero plus plus. Uh, firstly, zero plus plus. Uh, manage to reduce the communication volume of like half of it and the technique used in zero plus plus completely eliminates the intercode or gather communication in backward uh propagation and this technique reduced the gradient communication by 75 percent compared to reduce scatter uh also zero plus well uh optimally in integrates each of the above techniques into the existing zero implementation translating the four times communication value reduction to real throughout improvement. So after all the amazing things done by zero, zero plus plus actually uh, make it more easy for the communication between more devices, multiple devices. Uh, so if you want to try a larger model with maybe maybe 1000 devices, you, you should use zero plus plus, which uh, can ensure your communication between all those devices more efficient. So after all we talk about, after all the things we talk about, what's the capability of the deep speed chat? Even though it use hybrid engine, it uses zero plus plus, what's the capability? So by using hybrid engine and zero plus plus, one, it may it may makes it possible for one one step for multi training process. Remember that we are when we are talking about fine tuning, we mentioned there's uh, three steps. Uh, supervised fine tuning, reward mode, and uh, reinforcement 
reinforcement learning from human feedback. But deep speech can make it ha happen as one step. A single script is capable of taking pre-trained hugging face model, running through all three steps of the instructability training using the deep speed uh, RLHF system and the producing your producing your very own chat gb like model so it's very easy to use uh, even though the the concept behind it is very complex but uh it it is very easy to use and uh, uh as we just mentioned the combination of sft reward mode or lhf and it also have the hyper engine with the training and the inferencing the other reason uh the other amazing part of the capability of uh, deep speech chat is, is cheap, fast, and heavy duty. Deep speed actually is over 15 times, 15 times faster than the existing system, makes the RLHF training for both fast and affordable. Since we know that we, if we want to use the GPU uh, on the cloud, we should pay for it each minute, each hour. So the faster you train, the less you pay. And deep speed actually supports models with hundreds of billions of parameters that can achieve excellent scalability on multi-node and multi-GPU system. Uh, the other thing, amazing thing about deep speed chat is, is, uh, it, is that a user can modify its engine. So here it's actually the markdown file, uh, markdown provided by the, the developer and here is how they how you to modify your own engine. So engine is deep split, uh, that's okay. But you can see that the action mode, the create mode, you can use your own mode. So which is uh, highly modifiable. And the tokenizer, uh, remember what we just talk, talk about a tokenization is to break down the big, a uh, large set of text into smaller ones. So the tokenizer or the tokeni tokenization rules you have uh, basically defines what kind of AI models you're gonna get. For example, you if you have a sentence tokenizer, so the AI model probably answer you with sentence. But uh, if you have a word tokenizer, it might answer you in a different way. And the number of total iterations, the number of total iterations uh, that how much times do you want to you do you want to train the uh, the AI model and all the arguments you need and the trainer. It's uh, engine. You can define the engine here. Arguments here. Uh, during the tr uh, tr uh, the fine tuning process, the output. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Be, what we... So be yeah, sorry. Uh, are mm -hmm. you talking about talking about the markdown file because we couldn't see it? We didn't see the oh, markdown yeah, yeah, file. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you didn't see the markdown file? Okay. No, we are still at the uh, the slide. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Can you see the markdown oh, okay. file now? Yeah, yeah, we can see the markdown file now. Uh, just one, one, okay. one question uh, before you move on to the markdown file. So you talk mm -hmm. about like the three steps, right? The first step is the F, uh, SFT, and the second step is the reward model. So those uh, are clear. But then the third step is the reinforcement learning with human feedback. But it seems like, um, we are not really providing with any of our feedback is prepackaged uh, feedback, maybe some questions, question answer pair or something. Could you explain a little bit detail regarding the third step, how the deep speech chat can automate the RLHF phase? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, so for the third step, uh, for step, third step, uh, it's uh it's uh so the third step we, we know that the, in the during the third step uh there's two things happens one is actor mode interact with the envi uh, in, in, with the environment one is the actor mode uh interact with human feedback but uh we know that there's billions of parameters or we we would train it with maybe millions of times uh so. Uh, what we do basically, we can't uh, respond to the each question with immediately. Uh, it's like it's like each time it, it was the AI model was trained, we can't just sit there and answer the question. Uh, it's it could take too much time. So uh, what deep speech chat do is use the uh, 
is use the, the data set we provided, which is the right answer. And we might provide a new data set uh, that is more specific and uh, which is more, uh, uh, more, more aligned with our preference. So the, the deep speech chat will use that as the human and the human response to the, uh, to the, you know, to, to the AI models and to like mm -hmm. to um, fine tune the preference of the actor mode. Right, right. So it, it means that they have some preset data sets with you no know, human preferred answers, uh, to provide you no know, uh when the uh in the third phase uh when we train the model the model are going to do some predictions and we are going to compare that prediction to the preset uh answers from the data set uh using that as the feedback is is that a fair uh statement yeah 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 i think that that that, that i think that's a uh, first statement Okay. Okay. So that that makes sense. And and then if that is possible, we we could think about, um, no, because now, uh, as as some of you may know that, uh, the ChatGPT model and other, uh, proprietary models have been sometimes illegally used for people to train their own large language models. Uh, and. Then, well, someone could think about, you no, know, be clever enough to think about linking the third phase, right, from uh, from from our model here using Deep Snapchat, and then um, uh, Deep Speed Chat, and then linking that to uh, uh, to ChatGPT model, so that whenever a question is asked. They are going to borrow the answer from ChatGPT to use to ask the you know, human feedback uh, uh, to train uh, your own language model, right? So that opened a, a can of worm here uh, because, of course, that is uh, that is against the fair use, but is fairly hard for those companies, uh, OpenAI or Anthropic to figure it out and, and forbid those um, you no know, unethical use uh, of their uh, proprietary uh, engines. Yes, yeah, so, so go ahead. Yeah, so that was just a, a, a comment I'm, I'm, I thought about. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably happened because uh, if you check the privacy uh, policy of ChatGPT, you can find that uh, they, you can find that they might use uh, uh maybe not ChatGPT, but uh, I definitely saw some AI models in the policy. They said that they might use your uh data, your response, and uh, and for analytical purpose. I think this probably uh they might use it for the reinforcement learning from human feedback. So I I think uh yeah that's is probably what's going on now. Um, so in the engine, so here is a. Uh, how people can customize their own training pipeline using the deep speed chat API. And here you can see the actor mode, uh, you can design, you can define it. And the creator model, or we see the reward mode, you can define your own mode and the tokenizer here. Uh, tokenizer basically defined how you break down your text file, uh, your text data set. And the trainer here will use deep speed PPO. Remember, we just talked about PPO, PPO trainer for the engine and the arguments. And during the training, the out the output is uh is using the train trainer to generate an experience. And the experience here, uh the 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 experience here will used for the critical loss, actor loss to uh for the trainer to itself to update its policy. So this is basically how everything works here. Um, so, uh, so those are the code that uh, would be sufficient to uh, to train a, a large language model. No, no, all... no, that would not be, yeah, that that's would not be sufficient. Uh, but here, here, uh, we're gonna talk. A, okay, uh, yeah, we, go ahead. We go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you guys later about how to deploy it, 
in the, the data set we're going to use. And here is a more straightforward example of how uh, deep speech chat is, uh, is capable of. You can see here, uh, if you use A140 GB GPU, use eight of them. And if you want to train an AI model with 13 billion parameters, it only takes almost like 1.85 days, it's almost two days, and you and everything is done. And I think this GPU is free on the cloud, I think. Uh, and if you want to use more advanced one, like A180 GB, it only takes like the same task, only takes it like 80 hours and 80 hours and like $580, which is much cheaper than we thought. Uh, this is a single node, single node, which means there's only one device in eight GPUs in one, uh, uh, yeah, uh, not one device, it's that eight GPUs, but they all communicate through the same node uh, with each other. So that might take a longer time, but if you have more than, more than, more than one node here, uh, you got 60 seat, uh, 64 uh, GPUs here, and you got more than one node, uh, make them to communicate with each other, so you can train a much bigger uh AI models with only like five thousand dollars, and only within twenty four uh, twenty four hours within one day. So this is uh very advanced uh compared to the existing solutions. Also, if you want to train a very simple one, if you want to train your own AI model in a very simple one, and you don't have much time, and you don't want to pay anything, it's also okay uh that. You want to try a 1.3 billion parameter chat read model by deep speech chat on a single commodity in the beta A6000 GPU with 48 GB memories, only take like 2.2 hours according to the developer. Um, yeah, so uh, well, BM, BM, could you go back to the previous slide? Uh, great, yeah, so this slide is, is fantastic. Uh, so just for someone's, uh, no, uh, everyone's knowledge, uh, the OPT models that are you know, showing here, they were developed by Meta or previous Facebook uh, probably a year or, or two years ago. Uh, so they released different versions of OPT models uh, from as small as about 7 billion all the way to 175 billion, which is about the same size as GBT3 model. Um, so here, actually, no, you, you probably wonder why no, those no, they, they provide different sizes, right? Of course, no, we have the, the, the scaling effect, right? The larger model is, the more capable the model is, and more generalizable the model is. So the smaller models uh, may not be as capable as larger models uh, to answer sophisticated natural language processing questions. And uh, to give you some context here, for example, B U I mentioned about the, for example, uh, no a one hundred no forty uh, gigabyte of RAM, so that is about the size uh, that you can actually run for free uh, using Google Colab. So some of you have taken my course, and uh, then for a single CPU, a hundred. Um, no, 40 gigabyte, I think that's trainable using the free version of Colab. So if you want to pay and then probably you can get up to maybe uh, 80 uh, gigabyte so you can train a, a larger model. But then also consider the size of the model, right? So usually, usually the, the rule of thumb is you can fit a 7 billion model, 7 billion parameter model within a single GPU, right, uh, on average. So that is the reason why actually you've seen many other models, uh, not only OPT, but the recently the MPT model, uh, the Llama, Llama 2 model, the, the all you know, uh, released the 7 billion version as one of the many versions, because 7 billion can be deployed in a single GPU, whereas more than 7 billion uh, is harder. Usually you need more than one GPU. So that is the, the, the context here. Yeah, go, go ahead, Binyuan. Yeah, uh, then I'm gonna show you how to like how to deploy, uh, because we want to use it. So let's see how to deploy. Um, here uh, I run it on a collab. Uh, here is a deep state demo, and I uh, so we can so let's get started. Let's get started, and we have to make sure that we have a we have a GPU. So we. We change the runtime, and we have, uh, we have a, like a one hundred GPU here, and 
and then let's get started. Firstly, we have to know what, uh, how much memory and let's like resources we have. So we run the, uh, run here or run the code here, and we can see we have uh, 30, uh, 80, uh, 83 gigabytes, uh, and about 83. So it's basically 80 is what we can use here. And also we want to check uh, that if we have the GPU, uh, we have right amount of GPU. So NVIDIA, uh, so since we are using E100 GPU, it's, it's a NVIDIA uh, GPU. So we run, the, we run the code and see that, yes, we got, yes, we currently got a GPU available. Uh, so let's get started. So firstly, we have to install, of course, we have to install the deep speed. Uh, we have to install the deep speed from GitHub. And this is what we have to, uh, this is actually pretty easy. You have to, to what you have to do is pipe install. And then we give this some time. Okay, it's down. And then uh, remember we talk about the transform, uh, what, what we talked about uh, previously is about the, uh, the framework and the, uh, or everything is about tr transformers because we later we're gonna use uh, AI models from Hugging Face, so we have to install transformers here. Uh, and then, uh, then after we have uh, everything we need, every packages we need, and then uh, we import all the functions, the torch from torch uh, and from transformers. We import our trainers and. Of course, our, okay, it's done. It's done in the, the inputs rules, outputs rules, uh, or the frameworks we have. Then, uh, then as we know, we need a framework. So here we are downloading the PyTorch framework uh, from the GitHub. So give it some time. Normally it takes like less than one minute to finish everything. Uh, so could you explain a little bit about the trainer? What, what is the, uh, why you define a custom trainer there? Oh, here, uh, the custom trainer is, uh, since we want to use, uh, uh, we want to use deep speech chat, uh, but, but we want to like, this, this trainer is actually, uh, you know, uh, we want to train our own AI models and we don't want to use like, uh, any existing uh, training frameworks. So we like de define our own trainer here. Uh, as we just mentioned here, the we can, uh, the Deep Street Chat allows us to uh, customize our own training pipeline. So uh, here basically what we do is to define uh, every uh, index we're gonna use during the training. Yeah, great, thank you, yeah. Thank you. So the, yeah. the, it seems like the trainer is just a standard standard Pyth uh, PyTorch code for for training, right? The, uh, yeah. Going through the, the model and then compute the uh, the loss function. Uh, so it's yeah, it's very much standardized. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if you want to use more customized uh, trainer, you can just add things here and modify all those. Everything is modifiable. Mm, right, right. Yeah, actually, yeah, you, yeah. you borrow the trainer actually from, you know, for those you are familiar with Hawking Face, that, that is the, the trainer from, from Hawking Face Transformers. Yeah. Yeah, and then we install PyTorch here, uh, all the, oh, we, we should restart the runtime. Yeah. I don't know what, uh, I, just, I think it's something wrong with my environment. So every time when I install, try to install the PyTorch, uh, it will require to restart the runtime. Oh, so, I think uh, the I think the reason is because PyTorch has already been uh installed pre-installed in, in Colab, but you restrict uh, to a different version. So actually, you're calling an earlier version is PyTorch one point one one. Now I think it is two point something. So that's probably the reason why there's uh incompatibility issues. Uh, so but uh, do do you know you absolutely need the the previous version, or maybe that is because the uh. This required certain versions are required by deep uh deep deep, uh, deep speed. No, uh, I think uh, it's not required by deep speed, but uh, it's actually required by the 
uh, the example, the AI models I going to use later. So, oh, okay. uh, so uh, yeah, that's why I reinstalled the, uh, the, uh, the PyTorch 1.1. So basically, we we need to, uh, then we, of course, we're gonna install Deep Speed. So the the Deep Speed actually provide us some, uh, can models, right? If I remember, Llama model was there, and MPT, and plus probably a few other models. Uh, but you here try to use a, a different model to get started. So that is the reason why you build this trainer and you want to use a model that is not the default models used in deep speed. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also we need to clone, clone the hugging face uh, transformers from GitHub. Okay, let's give this some time. So normally, but it only takes like ten seconds, or. So Pichi, yeah, so Pichi asked a question, have you met any package version conflicts? Because I saw you, I saw you specified all versions. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, here where I try to install Torch, uh, last time where I tried to install Torch, I, uh, I installed like two point, like, like it's, it's Torch 2. And uh, the AI models I'm gonna use later is not support. So I use one, but uh, I think if you're gonna use your, if you want to use your own uh, AI models, I think this wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, it's very much depend on what model you want to use. Yeah, yeah. And all the requirements, all the, all everything we have, and then we start the configuration. And we start the configuration here and everything is all set. Then this code, uh, this code are uh, actually the example of a training uh, and uh, evaluation. But uh, since we don't have much time, we can't train the AI model for 10, 10 hours, six, uh, maybe one day, two days. So this AI model would only train like for one minute. But we can see that what can uh, AI model that train with only one minute is capable of. You can see that I started downloading uh, all the informations, the configuration, the other configuration things, and uh, all the AM, uh, the pre trained AM models we have, and the data set. Uh, so, you can could, see could, you, could, could you go back a little bit and talk about those configurations in, 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 uh, yeah, in that shell? So, what those configurations pertaining to? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, this is actually the uh, configuration. Firstly, uh, we we notice that there's a, a memory management uh, of the deep speed and uh, the the footprint management in this this the code of the code uh, in deep speed uh, is FP sixteen. I I assume that's maybe the sixteen version, and optimizer uh, also also the memory optimizer. Uh, mm -hmm. And the weight, uh, the weight optimizer, you can see that this we set it to auto, and uh, this is uh, actually how one uh, on one hand this will help you to uh, optimize your memory and uh, create the model. I think also the critical model uh, you have to, uh, if you want, if you want your custom uh, weight, uh, you can set it here rather than auto. Mm -hmm. And the scheduler uh, also remember we talked about the zero engine, the zero engine, zero plus plus engine. Uh, this is a configuration for the zero engine, and uh, the device uh, what where will we run the zero engine? Uh, is on CPU and uh, the memory, uh, or the memory management, uh, or 
and this uh and actually this this uh index is uh i i emailed the developer and they told me uh you should use this index but they never explained why uh so uh so i just copied it mm. and uh and all the gradient accumulation steps and uh everything you can see here the trend band size always said most of the most of them you can set it to auto um so this is basically the I see, configuration yeah. okay so those are the configurations for the 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 training the uh... yeah okay. yeah for okay. the training yeah okay and you can see uh here uh the trans uh using the transformers uh and uh we're gonna train the uh AI model so here uh the numbers of GPUs only one exam mm -hmm. and the example of translation is run translation dot uh dot uh dot py uh it's uh it's basically the the AI uh the, the data set we're gonna use it's a uh, uh translation data set is the English words and the Romanian words uh so it's i find this translation data set example and you can do trend do evaluation label smoothing uh everything here i said most of the data default and the max source lens 128 max top lens 128 there's all default numbers and you can set it maybe higher that depend on your on the gpus you have and the number of trend trend uh of course this means I only trend once. That's why it only takes one minute. If I said it's one hundred, it takes forever. Uh and overwrite uh and all the all everything you can see here is all the default uh and the warm-up steps, for example, is all the default numbers. So we can see here after training, after downloading all the data and train itself for only one minute for only once uh, one time uh we can see that the training complete and we i have already shared this to the hugging face so we can see it later in the during and you can also see the evaluation here uh only one trend only one time and the loss is about five uh also, the evaluation of uh, this is a trend matrix. That's the evaluation matrix. The trend matrix, uh, it's the engine that related. Uh, remember the the graph that act mode and the trend uh, trend engine inference engine. Uh, the graph, the basically the evaluation of that part. Mm -hmm. So in the so after sharing this uh, AI model that's only trained for one minute to the hugging phase. Here, uh, I find here, uh, it's a, it's a hugging face and in the hugging face. And if you, uh, thanks hugging face gave me a very user friendly friend, uh, uh, website here so that I don't have to use the, the code line. So if I say English, if I say English here and the compute, let's see what will the what will the AI model give me? So it gave me lips, 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 lips. So th this is because we only train the AI model for one minute. So basically it's not, nothing about uh, what we want. And it has uh, almost zero capability of inference, uh, but it's only just no, I have to respond something. Uh, so this this is why this uh, language model is not very good. But if we train for longer time, maybe for one hour, two hour, maybe for ten hours, that response could be much better. Uh, so Bin Yuan, could you go back a little bit uh, to the to your code that I have? Uh, so here I I saw that uh, in the last uh, if you show you the last line for your code. Uh, not the output. Yeah, here uh, I saw that you provided model name as T five small, so that is a uh, a model, I guess, from transformers, right? Uh, and then you mentioned something about yeah, the run translation dot pi. Where that that example come from? Did you uh, find it somewhere online and, and put there? Uh, uh, you mean this example? That's right. Yeah. So th this is example that you use to fine tune or, or retrain your your model, right? So mm -hmm. that, yeah. So that, yeah. That, 
So where yeah, that's example actually actually is provided by PyTorch. That's you know it's in the in the example uh, pack, uh, in the uh, in the example uh, uh, file uh, in the example file. Uh, but if you you want to use other other examples like for example here, you can find everything you can find in hugging face. Here, all you need to do is to deploy this. Maybe I just choose one of them randomly. You can deploy this. Uh, uh, you can deploy this data set to uh, to here and make sure uh, make sure uh, it's cloned from the uh, hugging face and you can just deploy it here. And you will oh. fine tune with the data set you choose. So you, you mean deploy means that you just provide the the link to, to oh, no, what, it's whatever. not just a link. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have to provide file. a link. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when you are downloading PyTorch, uh, it's also downloaded at the same time. So uh, so we can find the examples of uh, PyTorch translation here. But if, for example, if we want to use maybe uh, maybe the example from Hugging Face, we have to deploy it before we start the training, like download it in somewhere else. We we'll oh, have to download okay. it first. Right, right. Basically, right. download to your Google Drive and then provide the yeah, the, 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 provided the, the path the, the path yeah. there. Okay, so I think uh, yeah. Charles has the same question. Yeah, uh, Charles, is the question you want to ask, or you have a different question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of my question. I mean, if you don't mind, I follow up. What is the structure of how the data is supposed to look like? Um, could you just? I know you showed it earlier, but I, I didn't quite catch that. Yep. Oh, you mean this? Uh, this data. So let's yes, see that's if correct. we can find. Yeah, let's see if we can find in. Uh, data. Let's see. Uh. Uh. Let's see. I can't quite remember where did I download this one. Uh, I torch. So it it seems. That you download it to, I guess your, your 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 Google Drive somewhere, right? Uh, or not not linked to the mount to Google Drive, and then you could find probably, uh, if you click the uh, yeah, to your left hand side, you have you, you see a folder. You probably could see that in the folder. Uh, it's not it's not a it, uh you you, you can. I'll go back to the uh yeah to to the yeah code you see the folder here yeah yeah I guess it's there oh, yeah. somewhere there yeah uh or maybe not yeah, yeah. Let's see. transformers yeah oh transformer examples oh, no, right is that I torch I torch and the translation here mm -hmm. and uh. Is that a run translation pi, py? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, this is. Uh, I see. Uh, yeah. So if you want this, uh, this file, I can just share it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank. Thank you so much. Sorry to make you go through all that, but yeah. No, no, not a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can just share it. You can train your own AI models in as much as you want. I see. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, and I'm guessing you could you could also deploy your own. You don't necessarily have to use the hugging face ones, right? You can use your own yeah, personal yeah, yeah. ones. You don't have... All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hugging face makes it easier for you to share your model make it to the whole community. So most time I use hugging face. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and I think this basically everything I have for today. Uh, that's okay. So yeah, this is fantastic, Bin Yuan. Uh, so this uh, this truly exciting because we have not seen uh such applications before. Uh, so this is the first time that I saw we could uh we could run and train our own large language models. It's 
uh, I would say probably you no. Know, we haven't really tried that, but hopefully the the training process can lead us to a much more powerful model than what we could do previously using fine tuning approaches, right? Because I think uh, there are at least two. There are at least two uh, major uh, advances. One is the training speed and the cost, right? Uh, the other is the incorporation of the uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback structure uh, into the training and definitely should improve the capacity of the model and the sensitivity to uh, our human language. So thank you, uh, thanks a lot for being on. I, I saw that you made a lot of uh, a lot of work, make a lot of efforts to uh, to deliver this very exciting presentation. Thank you. Thank, uh, you. And, thank you all. Yeah, and uh, so we'll meet again uh, next uh, two weeks later. I'm ahead of me myself, and two weeks later, uh, we we ask. Uh, Fun to present the uh, another very exciting topic. Uh, I'll I'll just post here, but then uh, you uh, you is going to send a, a more detailed dis, uh, description later. It's called the meta flow. So Fun is going to talk about how we can leverage the power of meta flow to do a lot of uh, you no know, the uh, machine learning tasks. Uh, from end to end, basically from data, uh, the, the the data preparation all the way to model deployment. So Metaflow is a framework uh, constructed by Meta and then make open source, and it draw a large community of people using Metaflow as a way to uh, to disseminate machine learning models at scale. Uh, so it has the capacity to run, of course, no, uh, in your Jupyter notebook, but actually it can do a lot more. Uh, it can leverage the power of multiple GPUs in the clusters, deploy in the server, and uh, be really uh, beneficial to many other people you know, besides just uh, data scientists. So that is the reason why we want to introduce Metaflow. Um, because it's a hot topic and it has a active, a large active community around it. Uh, so uh, that's all for today. And thank you for all of your interesting interest and participation. So we'll see each other in two weeks. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.